Good morning. Bienvenidos. When are we going to be able to cut the music? Maybe. <laughs> I'm going to do it with the music. Why not? <laughs> okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Hopefully, the music will stop momentarily. Uh, welcome to our general session this morning, and thank you very much to the Familia Cortez for sponsoring our delicious continental breakfast. I want to hear uh, what you thought about yesterday's panels and events. Was it, weren't they amazing? <laughs> Wasn't it incredible to see young people sitting side by side uh, by elders? And I, I have to say, I think in the current context that we're in, our young people, our students realize, are maybe realizing for the first time how their history is applying to them and their current lives and their families' lives today. It was such a powerful moment. Um, thank you for, for coming back today, for joining us, and continuing our journey as we examine where we are today and what our path is forward. And as we reflect this morning on the current status of civil rights in the US, you will hear from the daughter of one of our heroes, Dr. Hector P. Garcia. We all know him as a passionate advocate for Latino civil rights in the United States. He was one of the many Latino veterans who served in World War II. He served as a hero. He served as a hero abroad. I need a new battery. Does anybody have a battery? Triple A. Oh, all right. They gave me an extra. Thank you. Hello? All right. Okay. He served as a hero abroad. Uh, he, like many other veterans, had new educational opportunities they never had access to bef before bef because of the GI Bill. But when they returned home, uh, they found that they and their families were still being treated as second class citizens in their own communities and they chose to do something about it. Dr. Garcia provided medical assistance to those who could not afford it or who were denied treatment. And as he treated soldiers and low-income Mexican-American families, he observed firsthand the intolerable discrimination of his people. Latinos had to pay to vote. Their children attended segregated schools. They were not allowed to enjoy public places and they weren't allowed to buy land outside the barrio. He founded American GI Forum in March 1948 in Corpus Christi. In response to the many acts of discrimination he and his fellow Mexican Americans suffered. Of course, GI Forum's first victory was uh, rectifying the unfair treatment of Private Felix Longoria, a soldier who had been killed in combat in the Philippines. His family approached Dr. Garcia for assistance because the only mortuary in his hometown of Three Rivers, Texas, would not allow chapel services for a Mexican-American. Dr. Garcia enlisted the help of congressmen, the governor, senators, including Senator Lyndon B. Johnson, and the injustice became a national story which prompted a quick response from Senator Johnson, who offered to have Private Longoria buried with full military honors in the Arlington National Cemetery, and his family accepted. Uh, Dr. Garcia led many more battles against school segregation, equality and fairness in court proceedings, and supporting presidential candidates. And of course, he was recognized uh, by the nation for his work with the highest civilian honor, the Medal of Freedom, by President Ronald Reagan. So as we think about the predicament that we have in our country today, where our community is literally under attack by its own elected leadership, I hope that we in this room, and especially our young people, can recognize that there is no challenge before us that we have not encountered before and overcome. But key to those victories, when our community is threatened, is to hear the call, like Dr. Garcia and other giants. And like them, we must offer our time, our talent, our heart. We must stand together, and we must never ever back down.
Well, Dr. Garcia once said that he thought the most important thing that has happened to Mexican American people was now we feel that we belong to this country. This is truly our country and we may keep our pride and dignity. That we are Mexican in origin and, and in blood, but we also now have the feeling that we are accepted as Americans also. Some years ago, I had the honor of providing testimony at the US Commission on Civil Rights as a civil rights lawyer at MALDIF. So it's a special treat to hear from our current chair, Catherine Lehman, in just a moment. She's a renowned civil rights attorney and advocate, and I admire, admire her very much, and always have, even when I was a young attorney. My testimony focused on civil rights violations in family immigrant detention centers. And as I delivered my testimony, I distinctly remembered a feeling of shame, of remorse. I felt ashamed that this was happening in my community, in my generation, and in my time. And as we examine our current state and our general session this morning, I hope we can all agree that even though no one is expected, no one expected to face some of the challenges that we're facing now, this is our country and its promise is as great as it ever was and it's worth fighting for. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this morning, Dr. Richard Avena. He is the retired Southwest Regional Director of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. A native of El Paso, Texas, Dr. Avena attended the 1968 hearings that we are commemorating uh, today on assignment for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He, now, he was supposed to send, spend six months in San Antonio, but he never left, <laughs> fortunately for us. And today he serves as our chair for the 50 Years Later Committee. Thank you so much for your work, Dr. Avena. And Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your vision in bringing us together today. You. As you can tell, some things have changed in 50 years. <laughs> a lot of people have called me a lot of things, good and bad, but I've never been called Dr. Avena. I am not a doctor. I don't have a PhD. I'm not even a lawyer, and some people accuse me of talking like a lawyer. I said, well, I, that's a long practice. I practiced a long time to do that. I, uh, I got here early yesterday, about 7.30, and I parked right here in front. I did not know what to expect. I was nervous, to tell you the truth. I didn't know what was going to happen. And slowly, I saw people parking their cars and walking in and there were a lot of older people like me, and there were people disabled like me, and they were pushing their little <clears throat> carts to get in. And then we went into the auditorium. And as the auditorium started filling up, I started feeling a lot better. I thought, well, maybe there will be a lot of people here. As the, after the, uh, the presentations at the auditorium, and then we went to the workshops, two or three of the workshops I went to, they had to turn people away. In fact, Mauro mentioned in the voting rights, he said, you know, it's a good sign when they have to turn people away from a workshop. And two or three of them had the same thing. And um, so then I felt a lot better. I thought that, you know, people were very, very interested in, in what we were doing. I've been interviewed by a lot of media. I even had an hour interview in Spanish by Radio Bilingue out of San Francisco. And uh, I, I lived in Latin America for a while, so I, I pride myself on being graduated up from Tex-Mex <coughs> to Spanish. <laughs> and uh, I taught at the University of San Carlos. And by the time I left to come back, I thought I was pretty good. Well, during this interview, <laughs> I got words that I, I could not remember what the translation was. Things like telephone pole, climbing up a telephone pole, and stuff like that. So I tried to fake it, and I don't think it came across very well. But what the heck? You know, it was a lot of fun. Uh, people, the media asked me basically two questions. What did the Civil Rights Commission accomplish? What did they do? And the second question is, why are you having this conference? Why, what do you hope comes out of the conference? Well. I thought a lot about the first question, and I think my answer is what Dr. Martin Luther King 
wrote in his letters from the Birmingham jail. He talked about social change. And he said, the first thing you have to do is legitimize your issues. Legitimize your issues. People in this country did not know about Mexican Americans. They did not know that they suffered discrimination. They did not know that they were being physically punished for speaking uh, Spanish on school grounds. It, it was just not known. Many issues that came out of the hearing in 68 were used by attorneys, by MALDEF, and by other groups to file a lawsuit that helped bring about change. And they would use, I told the commission in June when I went there, I said, when you go before a judge or you go before a jury and you have a report and it just says, well, there's discrimination, then people don't tend to necessarily believe it. But when it says the United States on commission, United States Commission on Civil Rights says immigration, voting rights, education, what have you, people, people take notice of that. And I think that to me, in my opinion, was the greatest thing that the commission accomplished 50 years ago. The second thing is that they said, well, all right, now why are you having a conference? What do you expect? Well, a lot of things. Uh, we had the great support of Our Lady of the Lake University. Uh, you know, uh, we met with uh, President Melby at the very beginning, and I didn't know what to expect there, but I'll tell you one thing. I can just summarize your people, the staff, the faculty, and everything with one word, and that's attitude. It's not an assignment. They weren't just assigned to work on this. It was their attitude. They would call us. They would, they would say, hey, well, what about this? And we need this. And it was just when we met their attitude. I've never been. I've been several, took me several universities in night school to finish my degree. But I, I graduated from a pretty good school, George Washington University. And I have never seen the attitude of the faculty and your students and your staff that I have seen here at Our Lady Clay University. <laughs> so, so to me, and what I tell the media is, this project would be an entire failure if it were not that the young people would take what we've done we have, we're having a conference, but we're also having a book published, a book, a report, that will tell us what it was like 50 years ago, what changes have been made, and what yet has to be done. This is a roadmap for social change. And the young people, the young people today, that are going to be attorneys, that are going to be researchers, demographers, what have you, can take this information and just nudge it forward and keep going forward. And hopefully that's what will happen as a result. Because in addition to the conference, as I said, we're publishing a report. Dr. Bob Bruschetto is in charge of that. And uh, he'll be making a presentation a little later. I want to do one last thing and then thank you for the opportunity to speak. You know, there are a bunch of us that are big shots and we have our names on the letterhead and they name me chair. I don't know what that means. That means that they ignore you, right? <laughs> but they give you a title and then they ignore you. There are people whose names never appear on the letterhead. And those are men and women, mostly women, but some men. You saw them out there registering people. You saw them stuffing bags, the H-E-B bags with candy and all that stuff. You saw uh, three women that came up to one of our meetings and heard what we were doing. And they said, oh, you need money for this? Uh, we'll give you $1,000. And you know what? They came across. They gave us $1,000. That's the second part of the miracle. A lot of people promised, but they came across with $1,000. And so to those people, that have worked so hard to make what used to be called make the trains run on time. Those people deserve our support and I'm gonna ask you to give them a big hand. Uh,
Among those people is a person that uh, was recommended to me that we needed to hire to work as a staff person. I had met her and I knew her and when I saw her at a meeting I recognized her but I really didn't know what she had been doing or whatever. And there's a person that works day and night to make sure the little tiny things are taken care of and the big things are taken care of and she catches hell from people when things go wrong and nobody really praises her that much. But Barbara Aguirre is my nominee for the employee of the whole uh, Okay, I'm gonna then ask uh, Barbara Schedel. Barbara Schedel has been around for a long time. That film we saw of Willie Velasquez on Thursday night, I didn't realize that Bob was, you were one of the pallbearers in Willie's funeral. That was you, wasn't it? Looked just like you. <laughs> and uh, Bob ran the research arm of the Southwest Voter Registration Project with Willie. And uh, when we were in Washington making our presentation before the commission, Bob used to tell, he said, Richard, you want to go to New York? Oh, God, are you kidding me going to New York? And so he said, Whitney and I used to run all over the country, New York, Boston, Washington, everywhere, just looking for money. And uh, Bob knows a lot of people and has a lot of connections, and that was worth its weight in gold. Bob, we want to thank you, too, for all your work in putting this report together. I want to thank all of you for being here. And don't forget to encourage the young people. Those of you that teach or those of you that talk to young people, uh, have, make sure that they read the study, the report, and make sure they're involved in things that will help bring about uh, social change because there's still a lot of issues that need to be resolved. One of them is immigration. When I uh, went to Washington, I, I was all pumped up. I was going to tell the commission how many, what achievements we've made in 50 years. My God, we've made such great. And then I read the Express News and it shows pictures of babies from Guatemala, babies from Honduras sleeping on the bridge between Piedras Negras and Eagle Pass, waiting to get in to claim asylum. I saw a report of a five-year-old child. They, she couldn't even sit on the chair in the courtroom. She, they had to help her up, put her up so she could testify before a judge on immigration issues. A five-year-old. That's not the way this, that's not the country I was born in. And I don't want to leave it that way in the country that I was born in. We need great strides and we need a lot of work to bring about a lot of changes. Go forth, do good, read the study, and God bless all of you, and let's have a great last day of the conference.